Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anthony Hickling, and I am the Managing Director of the Carbon Leadership Forum. The Carbon Leadership Forum at the University of Washington is accelerating the transformation of the building sector to radically reduce the embodied carbon in building materials and construction through collective action. We pioneer research, create solutions, foster cross collaboration, and incubate member led initiatives to bring embodied carbon in buildings down to zero. And we're harnessing the power of action at a grand scale. So we currently convene a group of 6,500 professionals from across the building sector, academia, nonprofit, and government groups representing 200 cities from 33 countries across the world. I'm grateful that the ETCC has caught on to the importance of this issue and look forward to collaborating with you all today. For those of you who are still becoming familiar with the concept of embodied carbon, this graphic provides a relatively straightforward visualization. So embodied carbon refers to all of the emissions associated with extracting the raw materials, transporting them, running the machinery to assemble them, etc. What we don't necessarily see on this chart is the end of life embodied carbon of a building, meaning <clears throat> What happens to the materials when the building is deemed no longer useful? Or do we burn them in landfill? Are they reused? Are they repurposed? And at the very beginning of the construction and design process, how do we include those considerations throughout our thought process? In between construction and end of life is where we see the emissions that we're all very familiar with, the operational carbon emissions. So these are related to the nature of energy usage and associated pollution generated by running heating and cooling, turning the lights on, et cetera, throughout the life of a building. So to know the total impact of a building, though, <clears throat> we must address both operational and embodied carbon. The building and construction sector is responsible for 39% of global carbon emissions. Between now and 2050, embodied carbon will make up nearly half of the building sector CO2 emissions. So it turns out that producing our raw materials and putting them together is incredibly energy and resource intensive. And while we're seeing improvements in operational pollution levels through energy efficiency practices and a more renewable grid, thanks to a lot of you, <clears throat> there's a lot of progress to be made on embodied carbon. So as we prepare to build on the scale of a new New York every month for the next 40 years, Embodied carbon is thus a neglected and time sensitive issue. The progress that we make now can dramatically reduce the environmental impact of all of this anticipated growth. And we must ensure that this progress is taking place on a global scale. So as I mentioned before, we're seeing improvements particularly in operational efficiency that help reduce a total building's impact, but this must be coupled with a more holistic consideration of impact. So reducing your company or your state's CO2 contributions, for example, can't come at the cost of increasing it elsewhere. So making building decisions that reduce total embodied carbon help us account for these types of carbon loopholes. At the Carbon Leadership Forum, we're building a movement that empowers building developers, engineers, contractors, designers, and other industry stakeholders to make carbon smart decisions. We conduct and consolidate the data-driven research and create resources that help you understand the big picture as well as identify specific levers for change. So these are some of the strategies that we're promoting. One is optimizing the project. So that includes strategies like new versus retrofit. Do you even need to build a new building or is an existing one completely okay to be able to be retrofitted, renovated, and improved upon so that way you have fewer raw materials that are required to put something there. Smaller footprint, do we have to build buildings as large as they are? And then program for efficiency. And then when we're looking at optimizing the system, are there alternative materials that we can be using? How can we get creative about new structural materials or other alternatives? Uh, what about the building shape? Can we change the building shape in a way that requires less? And then life cycle thinking. So coming back to the chart that we showed you at the beginning, how do we think about the considerations of the end of life for the materials? Can they be reused? Can they be deconstructed instead of demolished, et cetera? And then optimizing procurement. And so that includes strategies of transparency, embodied carbon limits and incentives, and low carbon specs. 
And when we're sourcing materials, transparency really is one of our major needs. So manufacturers must provide data on the embodied carbon impact of their materials to enable stakeholders to make carbon smart decisions. Furthermore, there's still a strong need for databases that help consolidate this information and help us understand what a good or even a better material looks like. At this point, we know the general best practices, but there's not enough consolidated information to make building and site specific decisions at the level we need. And some tools do already exist, but none are as robust as we need them to be. So the Carbon Leadership Forum, along with an organization called Building Transparency, for example, have built an open source tool called EC3 that some of you might be familiar with that helps contractors compare the information from environmental product declarations of materials when purchasing those materials for a project. This is an important first step, but we really need more data to be shared and consolidated in order to make more impactful change. And this work must happen in a larger system that spurs innovation and incentivizes sustainable building practices. So one way that we can build that system is by addressing procurement practices. And that could look like a lot of different things. We could, for example, reward low carbon manufacturers. We could spur innovation and demonstrate market potential. And driving transparency, like I said before, for this data is crucial. We need to set achievable limits today and then work to optimize that performance over time. And we're also moving toward the system of building codes that promote lower embodied carbon. So many examples of this already exist in states across the US as well as countries abroad and even some local municipalities. And so planning codes that address various materials and building strategies are really, really going to be crucial as we move forward. And California is actually a leader in that. We have a statewide bike clean policy. Um, Marin County has a low carbon concrete code. And so there are ways that we are starting to incorporate this into codes and incentive programs. And then we must continue growing our understanding of carbon smart building strategies. So to do so, we're supporting research and development initiatives that improve existing carbon databases, investigate opportunities for no novel building materials, and develop industry capacity and more, all while supporting economic equitable development. So how can we make sure that this is creating an economic system that works for everybody? To summarize, I'd like to reemphasize the importance of addressing embodied carbon now. It should be a top priority for all professionals working in and around the building industry. And to make it a priority, we need proactive leadership on a global scale. So I encourage you to think creatively about how to address this timely issue with the urgency it requires in your breakout sessions. And if you feel inspired to continue finding ways to make an impact, please connect with us at the Carbon Leadership Forum. We're looking for sponsors, members in our online community, and leaders to drive action in your local areas. As I said before, the progress we make now can make a huge impact and we need your leadership. So thanks for taking the time to work on this today. Thank you, Anthony.